Um, good morning and welcome. We're glad that you guys are here to worship with us. I'm just going to pray and then we'll get into worship. Jesus, we just come before you. We come before you to worship you. We come before you to thank you for how good you are to us. We come before you to thank you that we're no longer slaves to our sin and our shame. We thank you because you're good and you're faithful even when we're faithless. Lord, as we come, would we just cast all of our burdens down? Would we cast all of our idols down? Would we cast all of our distractions down? Would our one desire right now be to see your name high and lifted up? To lock eyes with you this morning, Jesus, that we would see you in full. Lord, and only out of that place that we would see who you've called us to be. Would you transform your people? Would we become a faithful people this morning? We thank you, Jesus. We love you in this place. In your name, amen. If you guys just want to stand, we're going to get into worship. Just as you are to worship, come, just as you are before your God, come, one day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every name will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, yes, now is the time to you are as you are before your God. Oh, come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to you are.
just as you are before your death. You unravel me with a melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears have come I'm no longer a slave to fear child of God. No, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me, your love has called my name, and I've been born again into your family, your blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child to die. No, I'm no longer a slave to fear. Yes, I am a child to die. No, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a 
standing on and you're more real than the wind in my love you're more real you're more real yes you're more real than the ground I'm standing on Yes, Abba, 
worship is for you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Yes, we love you, Lord. So thank you, Jesus. Set me free and Christ my Savior. You rescued me. Thank you, Jesus. You said. So we fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus, the greatness of his mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. Yes, we fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of his mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. And we cry, holy, 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 we cry, holy, 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 we cry, holy, 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 is the Lamb. Lord, we fall down. And we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of his mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. we thank you, Jesus. Jesus, we come before you and we thank you for coming down and being born as a baby that we might come to know the Father. For living a life completely righteous so that we might come to know the Father. So that we could see your example. Lord, for dying on a cross that we deserve so that we can know you. Lord, that we get to live in this eternal life, that we get to know the one true God and Jesus whom you've sent. God, when we start walking in that eternal life, would we no longer wait? 
Would we no longer be bogged down by the cares of this world? Would we live our lives for you, Jesus? We sit and we cry, holy, holy, holy God. Because you're so indescribable. You're so incredible. And we love you and we thank you, Jesus. So much more than we thank you for all the blessings that you bestow upon us. We just thank you for being you. We thank you for being our best friend. We thank you for being our high priest. We thank you for being the Passover lamb. We thank you for being our mediator. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Worship team. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to see you all. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Zach Yagan. Uh, I uh, go to this church. <laughs> uh, I'm the campus director for the Navigators um, at Michigan Tech. Um, I uh, have a lovely wife named Kelly, who's right in the back there, uh, and a cute little boy uh, named Marshall, who's in the nursery, um, and I'm, I'm preaching this week. Um, <clears throat> so before we kind of get into what I want to talk about today, because um, I'm going to continue in the vein of spiritual disciplines um, that we've been in for a while, um, I think it's a really important discussion. Uh, and so I just wanted to say a few brief words about why they're important. Um, and why I care so much about them. <laughs> uh, so if you guys could turn to 2 Corinthians 5 for me real quick. We'll just spend like a few minutes in there before we dive into the bulk of what I'm trying to, what I'm going to talk about today. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, we're starting in verse 1, says, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from our body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we, may, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is, what we are is known to God, and I hope it is also known to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that we may be able to answer those who boast about in outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regarded him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of the reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I just read an entire chapter 
Uh, and so I could do an entire sermon on that, right? There's a lot to unpack there. But I just wanted to say a brief word about why this passage to me is a key point of why we should be keeping spiritual disciplines. And it's this reality that's presented here in 2 Corinthians 5 that we're not part of this world any longer, right? We don't regard things as physical things anymore, but spiritual things. We are people who live in a tent, right? We're not people who are settled and and ready to stay here forever, but we know that we have an ultimate destination that we're moving towards. And people who live in tents live very different lives than people who live in houses, And so that's why I I talk about spiritual disciplines, and that's why I think it's important. Because when when you live in a tent, there's a lot of maintenance that goes on, right? There's a lot of things that we have to do that are different from when we live in a physical home. We know that this isn't where we're settled. We know that this isn't our final destination. And so we have to keep up on things. We have to keep walking these things. But then there's also this aspect in there, too, that we're ambassadors. While we are sojourning through this land that we do not belong to any longer, we're ambassadors to the people around us. And so if our lives look too much like the people around us, we have a problem. We have a problem, and that problem, I would say, is that we've built ourselves a house in the land that we don't belong. And so what what spiritual disciplines to me is ensuring that we're not settling too much in this world. But instead, we keep the hope that there's a home built for us in the land in which we do belong, in the final rest that God will give us in heaven. That's what living in a tent looks like. And so so when we talk about spiritual disciplines, it is a call to look different from the world around us. And I think this is going to be relevant to what I'm going to talk about this morning. Um, So if you guys want to turn now to Deuteronomy 5, um, that's where we're going to be spending the rest of our time. Um, And this is a little bit of a follow-up to what John talked about last week. Uh, John talked about silence and solitude and setting aside time for yourself to just be with God. Um, And so in, in some ways, what we're talking about is an application Um, But I also think that it kind of fits under this category of almost a reorientation. Um, And so we'll kind of talk about what that looks like. Um, I'm going to pray, we're going to go over the context, and then we'll get into the text. Uh, Lord, thank you uh, for this morning. Lord, thank you that we can be here, um, that you have given us your word. Um, Lord, I just pray that we can be your people. Lord, help us to reflect your goodness. Lord, help us to... Uh, understand your heart, um, help us to live it out. Uh, We can only bear fruit through you, Lord, so I just pray that you will be with us, uh, that you will keep us, um, and that you will walk with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so to root ourselves quickly in the context, this is the book of Deuteronomy. Um, So there's a couple of key things that have happened thus far in the narrative of the Old Testament. Uh, The first and foremost important thing is that God has freed his people from their enslavement in Egypt. Yes, he did it. They are are free from the oppressive forces of Egypt, and they are now out of there. But then they're in the wilderness, right? So so he he brought them into the wilderness. Um, He made a covenant with them. And then he said, I'm taking you to a promised land. I'm taking you to the land of Canaan, a land flowing with milk and honey, and there... I will give it to you, and you can live there and flourish. And so he delivers them through the wilderness, through trial and pain, and and he he gives them miracle bread and and food from heaven, and and he he does all these things to get them to the land of Canaan. And then when they get to Canaan, they send in some spies to check it out, right? And, And they come back, and they're like, oh, I don't know. They're like, these guys are really big, you know, like they're scary, and their cities are scary. I don't know if we can do this. And so they decide they can't. They're, they're, they're convinced that they can't do what God told them that they're going to do, which is to go and conquer and take this promised land. So God says, all right, none of you are going to go in. <laughs> uh, he says, this generation will not enter into the promised land. So then he has the Israelites wander around in the wilderness for 40 years until that whole generation, except for a few select people, 
pass away. So then Deuteronomy is essentially a message um, that Moses gives the, the next generation of Israelites to prepare them to go in and to take the promised land. And so a lot of it is like review. <laughs> a lot of it is reminding them of important things that Moses has already taught them. Um, well, that he's really taught their parents before. Um, but they're entering into a new situation. They're going in to conquer and take um, the promised land. Um, and so it's, it's, it's very important uh, because uh, if you think about it, you know, they've come and they've wandered and all they've known is wandering and all they've known is slavery and all they've known is the leadership of Moses. But now Moses isn't going into the promised land with them. They're going under new leadership in Joshua. And so, so, so that kind of paints all the things that God is commanding them and reminding them of in Deuteronomy so that they know and remember the things that are most important um, as they go in there. So the, pa- the part that we're going to read, we're going to focus just on um, the command for observing the Sabbath. Um, so in chapter 5, we're going to be reading 12 through 15. We're just going to camp out, uh, camp out, tents. Um, <laughs> we're going to camp out there for the rest of the message. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do no work, uh, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath. Let's keep reading, and then we'll get into it. Okay. So we're just going to kind of break it apart piece by piece so we really understand what's being talked about here. So it starts off, right, observe the Sabbath day. What does that mean? What does it mean to observe the Sabbath? A day, right? Observing it is to keep it, is to is to practice it, right? You you are an observer of the Sabbath. It means it, it keep you keep it as a practice in your lives. Um, and and here it kind of gives this sense that it means to partake, right? To be a part of the Sabbath. Sabbath means complete rest, right? That's what Sabbath means. In this verse, it talks more about what that means a little later. Um, in Exodus 16.23, which is the first verse that Sabbath is mentioned, um, it calls, God calls it a day of solemn rest, which I think is important to this discussion. And it will be clear as we continue, but I want you to keep that in mind. Um, and I want to emphasize that it's a different kind of rest than just rest for your body. Rest for your body is important when we talk about Sabbath. But there's a different aspect of rest um, that we want to be focusing on here. Okay, then it goes on to say to keep it holy. The observation of the Sabbath, the actual observing of the Sabbath, is what keeps it holy. I think that's important because it's it's not the work of setting it aside that makes it a holy day. It's God's blessing on it that makes it a holy day. Right? God is who makes the Sabbath holy by his blessing. Um, the reason that God gives for keeping the Sabbath in Exodus 20, which is the second time the Sabbath is mentioned, um, is, he says this, For in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So, here, keeping is different from observing it. Instead, it's emphasizing the fact that the day is already holy, right? And that God's people must keep it holy by observing the Sabbath. It's been set apart by God, so keeping the Sabbath is honoring God's blessing for it. It's not setting aside a day of rest once in a while, right? It's not setting aside a day of rest here and there, right? It is, it is the orienting piece of a week. God creates the earth in six days, and then he rests. And because God did that, that's how God's people said this is what a week is. It, it, it's rest and then the week, right? That's, that's how it works. And so it, it brings order into 
their lives. And at the center of it, right, is this piece of rest. It's not a special occasion. It's a pattern and a practice of resting. God ordained and God blessed resting. So, so then as it continues, it says, as the Lord your God commanded you. And so it's important to remember that this is a command from God. Right? This isn't Moses saying, hey, you guys should take a break. This isn't Aaron saying, I think we should take a day off to just relax a little bit. This is a command from God himself. So, so if we remember the context, right, this isn't the generation that was freed from slavery, right? This is the generation that has been raised in the wilderness. So maybe some of them remember um, the slavery, maybe some of them don't. Um, and these, this generation would have been observing Sabbath for most of their life, right? They would have, have, they would have received the first command of Sabbath uh, in terms of collecting manna, and they would have been um, keeping it. And so this is important to remember because that this rest doesn't end in the desert. Right? This isn't God calling them to take a rest while they're traveling around in the desert, but he's, he's preparing them to take rest as they go in to take Canaan as well, and for the rest of their time. Right, God is commanding them to continue in their observance of the Sabbath. And it's not just rest from travel. You know, they, Their command is a command of trust. So again, as, we, as we're thinking about what's happening, Right? They're, they're sitting, and they're ready to cross the river into Canaan to begin their work of conquering. Right? And so, so when Sabbath was first given to them, it was, it, was, it was a command of rest, and it was a command of trust then, because it was saying, listen, I will provide for you. Even in the wilderness where there is no food, where there is no water, I will provide for you. You don't have to endlessly labor um, to be provided for. But here, as we're thinking about where we're moving in the future, it's a command of trust, of saying, yes, you are going in to to take this land, but you can rest in trusting me for my protection of you, and that my promise is true, and it is good. So then it goes on to keep, it keeps saying, six days you shall labor and do all your work. So an important part of Sabbath it's not about being lazy, right? It's not, again, it's a different kind of rest than we, than we talk about, right? We have weekends, you know, it's, we, we stop our vocation for a couple of days uh, to get ready for the next week or whatever. It's not about being lazy. It's not about blowing off responsibility um, for a day. God's people are still hardworking, diligent people, working as unto the Lord, if you will, um, valuing rest isn't the opposite of that. Being careful to rest in the Lord is not the opposite of being hardworking. It is God, again, who gives this command to rest, not man. It's God's value out of his own character, out of his own value system that commands his people to rest. It is God who tells us to rest. Because when God rested after six days of creating the heavens and the earth, he didn't rest because he was tired. He didn't, like, come to the end of his creative ability. He wasn't panting and exhausted and needed to sit down for a while. The reason that God rested after six days of creation is because he looked on what he had done and said, it's good. It's good. I can be done with my work for a day because what I've done and what I've seen is good. He looked at his work, and he declared that it was good, so, it was, so he rested. So God's people, too, can do good work and stop to rest and be done with it for a while. And admittedly, right, this is difficult in most jobs, in most vocations, um, admittedly, right? It's, it's hard when, you, when your work, to know when your work is completely done, right? It's a little bit different from when, when God creates the heaven and the earth, because you can say, oh, it's done. You know, it's done and it's good. But the facts are, God could have continued to create. He could have, if he wanted to. But he didn't. He chose to be done and to say it's good, and to say that it's enough the way that it is. 
Um, but for us, right, even when you're at home, right, like you vacuum once, uh, and then you could probably vacuum again in three hours, especially if you have a child like me or if you have a dog or whatever, right? It's, it's, you do it, and it's endless. Like it feels endless. Like there's no end to our labor. There's no end to our work. But we have to teach ourselves to say when it's good, to say when, oh, this is good. This is good enough, to say I am done. Um, and there's an important value system in there that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, the rest of the verse also reminds us that this rest isn't an opportunity to pat ourselves on the back for a hard week's work and enjoy the fruit of our labor either. So what I'm not saying is that resting in the Lord is, is sitting back and being like, ah, you know, I did so good. You know, and I am great, um, and I have done it. I've done all the good for the week, and I can be done, right? That's not our place. Only God can truly do that, right? Um, and, and so as we look at that, right, that's, that's what I'm talking about of this change of values that's in there. Because what it's asking us to consider is that our value isn't in the work that we do. Our value is in who we belong. Our value is in the fact that God chose us, and God loves us, and he keeps us. That's our value. Because again, if we're thinking about the context of who this people is that's being talked to, their value once was in what their output was. Their value once was purely in how many bricks they could make. That's what they did when they were in Egypt. They were making bricks. And that was the only reason that they were valuable to the Egyptians. It didn't matter who they were. It didn't matter what their character was. It didn't matter anything. It's just how many bricks could they make. And so, so God is reaffirming, hey, you are now no longer slaves in Egypt but you belong to me now. And when you belong to me, I command and I demand that you rest because you are not, that is not your value any longer. And so, so it's not about our, it's not about congratulating ourselves. It's not about saying I did good. I can be done because I've done so many good things. But as we continue on in the verse, it says, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. The Sabbath is for the purpose of enjoying the work of God. It's not about us, but it is for us. He gives us rest because his value for us is not in our work. He gives us rest to remember that God is our redeemer, our treasure, our heritage, our stronghold, our hope, and our salvation. So then we get some, dis- some instructions, right? It says, And on it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, or your male servant, or your female servant, or your ox, or your donkey, or any of your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. This is how God wants his holy day to be honored. Think about that for a second, right? When we, when we place our value in the things that we do, wouldn't the Sabbath day, from our perspective, if we really believe that, wouldn't the Sabbath day be the day to do the most good? If we truly believe that God's love and affection and value for us is in our work, the Sabbath day, God's holy day, would be the day that we would do the most good. Right? That we would do the most work. That we would put out the most effort. But God's command and his, his request and how we honor his holy day is to rest. And he takes that rest really seriously. He wants everyone to rest, right? In that verse, it's not just the head of the household, right? It's not just whatever. It's the servants and the travelers in the land, and it's the donkeys and the mule. You know, it's like all these things are meant to rest because that's how God wants it to be honored. So it's not about status, right? It's not about who has done the most. It's not about who is the highest in society or whatever you want to say. Um, And so it's not an entitlement. 
for his people, right? It's not his, an entitlement for the people of Israel to say, oh, well, I have, am, am more deserving than anyone else in the world for arrest because of whatever, right? It's not because Israel is special and an exception to a rule of endless labor, but rather it's that under God, God's rule and authority, all people under that authority must rest. This keeps his people from becoming slave drivers like the people that they have been free from. It keeps them from being convinced that it's their effort, it's their ability, it's their power who makes them prosperous. It's, it's a requirement and a centering command to remember who they are and where they sit in the grand scheme of things. To have a day, like remember, to the Lord, Right? It's a Sabbath rest to the Lord where they remember who God is and what he's done. So it's not about them. It's not an entitlement. It's not, it's not a thing of boasting. In fact, it's the opposite. It's a day of remembrance to stop and rest and remove yourself from your work to say, it is not my work. It is not my ability, but only God's. Then he goes on to say, You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And so he's essentially saying, Don't forget the hardship that you've faced without rest. God, I, God, have delivered you through it. Don't forget that you're coming from a place without rest where your work was your value. Don't forget that you are now, instead, a people that I can call my own. Why do you think, again, God is reminding this generation that they were slaves? Well, again, they, a lot of them might not even remember that they were, what slavery was like. A lot of them may have forgotten. A lot of them may have been born but after, well after they were ever slaves in Egypt. And so when we look at that, we should understand that it's more about God's work and God's character than it is about their particular circumstances. If God hadn't rescued them from Egypt, they'd still be there. They would live and die as slaves. It's a call to remember God's deeds to his people. And so so as we look through the book of Deuteronomy and even the book of Leviticus and Numbers, we can see that a number, a good portion of the law is instructions on how to keep Sabbath and how to keep Sabbath-like things, uh, festivals and celebrations and days of remembrances, there's a whole section of the law that that's the purpose of it. And so, so God is preparing his people to remember him. He knows that he's giving these instructions to a forgetful and stubborn people. And so he's setting up ways in which they can constantly and always be reminded of the things that he has done um, to be faithful to his people. So this list includes Sabbath, Passover, the Feast of First Fruits, the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, the Sabbath year, and the Year of Jubilee, right? And all of these involve some kind of interruption of their normal life, right? Uh, A number of those require the men to, like, leave their homes and go to Jerusalem and, and present themselves, right? That, that interrupts their entire life to go do that. So a lot of them come with a special Sabbath rest where they have to stop their normal work and, and remember the Lord and, and build booths and do all these things to remember what God has done, to remember that God has delivered them from Egypt, that he's conquered their enemies. He's the one who makes their crops grow, right? The harvest, the festival of first fruits, right? He is the one who forgives sins, the day of atonement. He is the one, he is the Lord, their God, who has chosen them for his own possession. All of these things, including the weekly Sabbath, take the focus off of human problems and human productivity and selfish human ventures to refocus their minds on the Lord. And so then he continues on to say, Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So all of those are the reason why he commands them to keep the Sabbath, right? And so here's why it's relevant to us 
today, right? We, yes, have been freed from the law, right? That we're, not, we're not under any obligation that we should keep the law any longer, right? That's, there's, there's a whole doctrine of that, again, a whole, <laughs> a whole other sermon that I could be giving, but we're not talking about that. What, we're, what we want to talk about this morning is what is the heart of God in commanding this in the first place? And so when we look at this commandment and when we think about God giving it to these people, I think that, first of all, we should see that we have some commonality with the people of Israel, right? They were slaves in Egypt, and we were slaves to our sin. Romans six seventeen and 18, and then 22 through 23 says, But thanks be to God that you, were, you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and, having been set free from sin, have become slaves to righteousness. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification, and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. We have been set free. We have been redeemed from the killing power of sin. We've been, we've been brought out of that particular Egypt for all time. And again, going back to 2 Corinthians 5, we're sojourners in the land until we come to that final rest, that free gift of God, eternal life in Christ Jesus. Right? And like the uh, people of Israel, God has also been faithful to us. Uh, this is Hebrews 3, 1 through 6. It says, Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who is faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also is faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and hope. Jesus was faithful. His his crucifixion was an act of faithfulness to God's people. He was faithful to us. He also wants us to endure. Right? God's, God's command for Sabbath was to help them endure, to help them take rest, to help them in their, in their wandering through the wilderness and in, in their conquering of Canaan. Revelation talks again and again about those who conquer and those who endure. Like the Israelites, we are in the presence of our enemies. We have, we have crossed over the Jordan, and we too are again in a land in which we do not belong. And so we, we should be the ones who conquer. And we're fighting a spiritual battle day in and day out against the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we once walked. That's Ephesians 2, 2 through 3. We are fighting a battle. We have to take time to remember God. We have to take time to remember from what we have been rescued. If we forget those things, it's easy to just look around and assume that we're just a part of all of this, a part of all the things that we are surrounded by. But that's not true. We are fighting a battle, and we're, 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 we've been rescued from sin, and we're traveling through the land, being ambassadors, until we get to the place of our final rest. And ultimately, right now, before we get to that final rest, he wants us to rest in him. That's, that's a big part, that's the main part of the Sabbath command, right? Is that he wants his people to rest, not out of tiredness, not out of weariness, but out of their trust for God. He wants us to rest in him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30. He doesn't want us to be weary and heavy laden. He wants us to trust in him and stop our endless work and labor to come and eat from the bread of life 
and to abide in him, the true branch, right, of the place which true life comes from, only there will we bear not much, not just much fruit, but any fruit, only through Christ. So we must remember him. We need to orient our lives around him and our remembrance of him. That is the heart of the Sabbath and these other festival commands, right? Are we taking time to focus our eyes and our hearts on Christ? So if you think about what Pastor John said last week, that's a, that's a good first step, is taking time every day to just be quiet and peaceful before the Lord, to remove ourselves from the busyness of the world as best as we can, to focus our eyes and just be with God. It's a really good place to start. Right? That's a good place to begin. And every day is important, right? Because every day comes with its new temptations, and every day comes with its new trials, and every day comes with these things that are begging us to be distracted from the things that matter the most. And so we have to orient our lives around those things. Are we taking time to focus our eyes and our hearts on Christ? Are we taking times to remember the things that God has done for us? Are we being watchful and weary of what God has done for us? When we pray, do we pray with attention to what God is doing? Are we keeping track of the things that God has done for us? Have we completely forgotten that he has rescued us from our sin? Do we take for granted that we are God's people and live as if that's not even true? Do we presume on God's kindness and live every day with a sense of security that we may not deserve because we forget what we have come from? Church, I hope not. I hope that that's not true. We have to preach the gospel to ourselves every day. And I urge you to remember that part of the gospel is remembering from where we came. We were dead in the trespasses and sins in which one once lived. We have to start there. We can't forget that it was only by the work and the power of Christ that we have been saved. Are we remembering him? And then the last question is, are we orienting our lives around those things, or are we just getting to them when we think of them? Does our Christian walk just fall into the empty tracks of our life? Do we just get to it when we think of it? Do we just fill in the gaps in what we consider to be holy ways? Or are we actually orienting ourselves around Jesus? And so this is why I wanted to talk about Sabbath, right? Because Sabbath was a command to say every, one day out of every week is a day of solemn, holy remembrance and rest in the Lord. You can't get around that. And when, and when God first commanded the Sabbath, uh, they were in the wilderness, and it was about the collection of man, right? So they needed food, and so God would rain food down, and they'd collect it in the morning. But then on the sixth day, God would send twice as much manna, and they would gather twice as much, and they would cook it, and they would prepare it, uh, and then it would be ready for the next day. And then the next day, they had to take a holy and solemn rest. And so in that, they had their whole week would have been oriented around Sabbath, right? You have to prepare. You have to be prepared to rest well, right? You have to do that little bit of extra work. You have to, you have to, do, you have to move things around. You have to shift things around. You have to make sure, you know, if you're the Israelites, that that sixth day you are ready to do the extra work so that the next day you can sit and you can rest, right? You can't, in order to not break the Sabbath, which, by the way, in the Old Covenant, the punishment for breaking the Sabbath was death. Flat out. It was death. God takes this rest very seriously. And so if you didn't want to break the Sabbath, you had to do the work. You had to orient your whole life 
around the keeping of this day and the keeping of these other festivals? Are we orienting ourselves around our relationship with Christ? Now, thinking about our lives, we, it shouldn't be hard. <laughs> I'm just going to say that right now. It shouldn't be hard where we're standing because, first of all, we're all here on Sunday. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Thanks for being here. Is today, though, a day of holy, solemn remembrance of God for us? I can tell you not for me most of the time. I'm not spending as much time as I should on this day to remember what God has done for me, to rest in him, to reorient my life towards him. So I urge you, I encourage you, maybe start there. Start on Sunday. Don't let this just be you come and you sit and you listen. Maybe you sing some songs, maybe you don't. <laughs> don't just let it stop there, but take it home with you. Sit down with your family and say, let's, let's talk about it. Let's think about the things of God. Christmas is coming up, right? The world, and this is no new statement, the world wants us to think it's all about gifts and presents, right? The world wants us to think that it's all about uh, even just like family getting together and meals and fun and music and all these things. But what it's meant to be is a time to remember that Jesus was sent for us, to go back to Scripture every year to think this is God's fulfilled promise and I get to be a part of that and I have been saved and I have been rescued by that. There are things already in your life that could be there for you to reorient yourself around. And so what I'm asking and what, I'm, what, I, what I was convicted of as I was doing this study and what I'm talking about is don't be a passive agent in this. Make a choice. Reorient your life to focus on God. And you may say, that's asking a lot. Maybe it might ask a lot of you to reorient yourself to God. It may be a big ask. But if that's the question on your mind, I would encourage you to go back and read and understand and consider what the gospel says. Is that your present reality, or is it a fun catchphrase that you've adopted? Are you understanding that without Christ, without his atoning and redeeming power, you don't get rest at the end of it? Do you understand that you have been rescued from the power of sin in your life? If you understand that, you should want to reorient your life towards Jesus. If you understand that, if you consider it, if you meditate on it, and truly understand what's going on there, you will want to. So yes, it might be a big change. But it's not a bigger change than the work that Jesus did by killing your old self and raising a new one alive with him. It's not a bigger thing. It is a very little thing in comparison. So, with that, um, I'm going to pray. <laughs> I have nothing else to say, is what, I, is what I'm saying. Think about those things. Pray about them. Talk about them with your family. <clears throat> Maybe you have some things that you want to change. Maybe you have some, some rhythms you would like to establish. And I encourage you to. Uh, we want to be identified as the people of God. Um, and I would argue uh, that our schedule and what it is based around is a pretty good start uh, to being identifiable as God's people. Lord, <clears throat> you do deserve to be at the center. Lord, you um, are our only hope. You um, are God. Lord, without you, we are distant and removed from any good and any holiness in the world. Lord, don't let it get past us. 
how, how big and immense the truth of the gospel is in our life. Lord, don't let it fall through the cracks um, to remember the kindness and the goodness that you have been to us. Lord, we are your people. That is such a humbling statement to me, Lord, that you adopted us as sons and daughters is such an insane <laughs> truth, Lord, that the God of the universe would come down and that he would do all the work, that you would do all the work, that you would die and be raised again for our sin is crazy. Lord, but out of your infinite wisdom, out of your holiness, out of your established plan from the beginnings of the earth, from before the beginning of the earth, Lord, that was your plan. While we were still sinners, you died for us. When we were least deserving, you died for us. God, I want my life to reflect that. Help us to know how to reorient ourselves towards you. Be our center. Be our focus. In Jesus' name.